thank you very much for having me. Um, as the uh, title says, we're going to talk about uh, treating acute pulmonary embolism with catheter thrombolysis. Uh, so pulmonary embolism, relatively common here in the United States, over 600,000 cases uh, per year. That averages about one episode per 1,000 patients. The cause of death or the annual cause of death by PE is uh, much greater than other publicized or more popular diseases. Um, you can see there that it causes or contributes to over 15 percent of hospital deaths. Uh, next slide. Um, there's three major categories of pulmonary embolism. You have a uh, minor or non-massive PE. Uh, basically, this is your normal tensive patient with some shortness of breath. They have no heart strain. Um, they have no evidence of myocardial necrosis. Uh, then you have a submassive PE. These patients are uh, normal tensive. They do have some uh, right ventricular dysfunction as exhibited by a right ventricular to uh, left ventricular ratio greater than 0.9 seen on either echocardiogram or CT scan. Uh, they may have elevation of cardiac enzymes, EKG changes. And then you have a massive PE, and this is going to be a patient in extremis. It's hypotensive, may require onotropic support. They may even present in a, in a, in a code situation. Uh, next slide. Um, so looking at the, uh, the patient population profile, the vast majority of patients are going to have either a minor PE or a submassive PE. That's going to represent about 95% of the population. Um, you see minor PE patients, they're going to have a low mortality rate, good prognosis. Submassive PE, actually I can have a 21% mortality at three months and up to a massive PE, which is 5% of the population, we can have up to a 60% mortality at three months. So a very uh, deadly disease. Next slide. Uh, so our main uh, treatment that we have for them, we have anticoagulation, which everybody knows, systemic thrombolysis, catheter-directed thrombolysis. Uh, mechanical and pharmacomechanical interventions that we'll touch on a little bit, all the way down to uh, surgical embolectomy. Uh, next slide. So anticoagulation, uh, everyone with a PE, uh, as long as they are not a uh, high bleeding risk, is going to be started on IV heparin or even some people with even minor PEs, uh, Lovenox. Uh, but basically anticoagulation, that is really only going to prevent further prop propagation of the clot or prevent um, further clot growth. It's not going to actually dissolve the clot itself. Uh, you're basically relying on the body's own natural uh, TPA to dissolve a clot. Um, so patients that already have heart, heart strain, that clot's not going to go away. Uh, they're still going to have a heart strain even when you start, the, uh, start heparin. And even after seven days, 33% of patients have ongoing uh, RV dysfunction. Uh, next slide. Um, so I'm going to touch recently, uh, just briefly, on treatment of massive PE. Uh, that is the most minor. Uh, or the most uh, uncommon. But basically, obviously, these patients need urgent treatment. If they're not a significant bleeding risk, they all need to have uh, systemic thrombolytic therapy. That's usually about 100 milligrams of TPA uh, over two hours. That's the most recent guidelines by the uh, American College of Chess Physicians. Um, if treatment fails or if uh, the patient is extremis, there are some more um, invasive interventions we can do that can potentially be uh, life-saving. Uh, next slide. And I'm just going to touch on a few um, endovascular uh, treatments that have been um, publicized for uh, massive PE. One is called the angiovac, and it is truly just a basically a vacuum tube that's placed uh, in usually through the femoral vein. Uh, next slide. goes up into the pulmonary artery, and you can see it kind of has a vortex-type uh, action that creates a suction. Next slide. Um, this actually, the setup for this is uh, pretty involved. You need to have an operating room team that uh, is familiar with the device that actually requires a perfusionist uh, to help run it. So having a cardi cardiothoracic uh, surgical uh, team as backup um, and present is necessary for something like this. But basically you have a large access in the femoral vein and usually in the IJ vein and you're able to, uh, next slide, snake into the pulmonary artery and uh, retrieve some of the clot. So they uh, obviously have... Um, good published results with this. It's pretty rare to use this. Um, I think we've um, only, I think we have, have access to it at Stanford Hospital. We've never had to use it. It requires a lot of setup. Uh, there have been uh, reports of injuring the pulmonary uh, artery with this. So not very common, but if you have the uh, means, it could be life-saving. Uh, next slide. So other type of catheter-assisted devices that you can use for uh, a massive PE, um, this is a type of uh, clot extraction catheter, next slide, um, that basically you can put it in the pulmonary artery and essentially macerate the clot, break it up. You can even aspirate the clot. You can see that their uh, picture of the clot they got was much less impressive than the, uh, the angiovac. But um, these devices can be life-saving nonetheless. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> 
and they can be used in, um, in an emergent situation that when you may not have access to a, a cardiothoracic team or somebody that's an extreme extremist. But they basically just cause distal embolization. They're trying, they basically just open up a channel to get blood flow into the lungs so that you may save the patient life. But they can have many, they can be complicated by arrhythmias, uh, pulmonary artery damage. There's really not a lot of good literature to support use for this. It's usually just anecdotal studies uh, for these type of methods. Next slide. Um, and of course, if, um, if you have a cardiothoracic team in-house and the patient is severely expressive they are, are in extremis or they have an extremely large PE uh, or even patients with chronic PEs, uh, pulmonary embolectomy may be, uh, may be the better option. Um, next slide. So submassive PE, much more common. Um, and as I mentioned before, uh, one thing that distinguishes the submassive PE from the uh, minor PE is going to be right heart strain. Um, so one of the questions is, should we treat these patients aggressively with thrombolytics uh, versus just IV heparin? Uh, next slide. So there's been several studies out there over the years um, looking at the effects of right heart, the long-term effects of having right heart strain. And um, most of this is usually, as I mentioned before, um, characterized by having an, a right ventricular uh, to left ventricular ratio greater than 0.9. Uh, so this is a study in chest basically looking at uh, uh, echocardiographic ratio greater than 0.9. They found this was an independent predictor uh, for uh, in-hospital mortality. Next slide. You can see that um, if the ratio is greater than 0.9, their in-hospital mortality went up to 6.6. Uh, next slide. Another study out of circulation. Uh, again, patients with uh, a high RV to LV ratio, higher, higher chance of adverse events within the first 30 days. Uh, next slide. Um, all the way up to 82%. Now, this did include patients with massive PE, but that is a small percentage of the uh, population, but still relatively significant. Uh, next slide. Um, another study, uh, Archives of Internal Medicine 2006, um, patients with right ventricular dysfunction, uh, essentially, if it's unresolved, it discharge uh, four times the mortality rate uh, than those in which it was reversed. Uh, next slide. Um, you can see kind of the numbers there. Uh, the mortality rate at four years, uh, 10.2 if it was unresolved versus uh, 2.4 if it was resolved and discharged. Uh, next slide. So what do these studies demonstrate? Basically, um, poor results or poor outcomes in patients that have ongoing uh, RV dysfunction either when they're discharged or um, after they're discharged. So this really prompts uh, consideration of uh, aggressive treatment to resolve the uh, clot burden and hopefully try to reverse uh, the right ventricular dysfunction to progress uh, or to prevent the progression. Uh, next slide. So what we have found is that systemic uh, fibrinolytic treatment, as I mentioned before, given about, about 100 milligrams of TPA uh, through the vein, it does improve right ventricular function. It does increase pulmonary perfusion. It does lower your incidence of recurrent PE. So it definitely does work. The problem is bleeding complications. Uh, major, major bleeding rates reported to be anywhere from 1, one to 21% with this therapy. Uh, intracranial hemorrhage, uh, 0 to 3%. So, in the submassive PE population, this would work, but applying it on uh, applying it to everyone may not be the best idea, and is somewhat controversial. So, um, over the last several years, people have try been been trying to come up, come up with a therapy that's kind of a happy medium between just IV heparin and uh, blunt use, uh, if you will, of thrombolytics. Next slide. Um, so. Recently, uh, probably over the past three years, we've been um, become experienced with a device. It's called the uh, the ECOS endovascular system, and basically what it is is ultrasound accelerated thrombolysis. So, um, it's a endovascular catheter, about a five French catheter, less than uh, a mil or around a millimeter and a half. And inside the catheter, it has uh, an ultrasound probe, um, and it also can uh, has multi. It's a multi-hole catheter that it can express. Uh, TPA right into the um, embolus itself. So basically the mechanism act of action is that ultrasound energy causes the fibrin strands to thin and loosen, therefore exposing more uh, plasminogen receptor sites, therefore your thrombus permeability and thrombolytic penetration are dramatically increased. So therefore uh, the drug acts faster, clearing clots sooner with lower drug dose and uh, hopefully no hemolysis. That's the idea. Uh, next slide. So. There's been some recent studies on it. As I mentioned, this therapy is relatively new. So this is out of 2014. Uh, this is called the Ultima trial. Um, this was a, a randomized controlled trial of, uh, of this ECOS catheter. Next slide. Uh, basically, they took 59 patients, um, 
they started out with like a 360 patient sample size, but they whittled it down just to 59, only with submassive PEs, and they randomized them to uh, IV heparin versus the uh, ultrasound-assisted thrombolysis. Um, and they basically gave 10, milligram, 10 to 20 milligrams of TPA over 15 hours, 20 milligrams for bilateral pulmonary emboli, uh, 10 milligrams for just one side. And they were really just looking at right heart strain over uh, 24 hours. Uh, they were looking to see if the ratio decreased. And then they also looked at uh, death, major and minor bleeding, uh, recurrent thromboembolism at 90 days. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> so what they found, they did find a significant uh, change in the RV to LV ratio uh, at 24 hours. It decreased from 1.3 to 0.9. That was a significant finding. There was no change in the heparin group. Um, other findings, they had a significant immediate decrease in PA systolic and mean pressures. That was a significant finding versus uh, <clears throat> not so with IV heparin. And then in 90 days, there was only one death. That was in the heparin group. Uh, they had four minor, minor bleeds associated with the procedures. That was in the, uh, or that was related to access site complications, <clears throat> but it was non-significant. Uh, next slide. Another study was uh, just published in August. This was a prospective uh, single arm multicenter uh, trial of this device called the Seattle 2. Uh, next slide. Um, this was uh, about 150 patients or so. They had they looked at submassive and massive uh, PEs. Um, they basically they had to have that confirmed by CT. Uh, they had to have symptoms for less than 14 days, and of course the uh, evidence of right heart strain, uh, RV to LV diameter ratio uh, greater than 0.9. Um, so their technique, they used a little bit more TPA. Um, they did a milligram an hour for 24 hours for one, uh, one device or treating one pulmonary artery or uh, a milligram an hour for 12 hours for, for two devices. So whatever they, however they treated it, basically they only gave 24 milligrams of TPA. Um, so similar outcomes, they did found a significant decrease in right heart strain with the RV to LV ratio, uh, decrease in pulmonary arterial systolic pressures, um, they had a 30% decrease in uh, pulmonary artery angiographic obstruction, and most importantly, they had no, uh, no significant intracranial uh, hemorrhages, only minor bleeding. Um, so promising results. Uh, next slide. Just looking at our experience, as uh, Paul mentioned, this is relatively new to us. We probably over the past two and a half years, we've done about 22 cases at two separate hospitals. We use a similar uh, protocol in that we give a maximum of 24 milligrams of TPA over 24 hours. Um, we have not had any, and this is a very uh, non-formal results, but we haven't had any intracranial bleeds, any deaths. We did have a, one minor bleed that I, that I know about. Um, we found that it was most effective for clots greater than 14 days. If there was any suggestion that the clot was uh, older than that, this was uh, not an effective therapy. Um, we did find some suggest subjective clinical improvement, uh, but nothing to really... Uh, um, Hang your hat on, if you will. Next uh, slide. So this is kind of a typical case where I think that it really worked out uh, well for us. This was a younger patient, 48-year-old uh, male. He was uh, <clears throat> found to have stage 2 colon cancer. He underwent a abdominal resection. Um, Post-op day 2, he developed a uh, kind of a submassive PE, right heart strain, shortness of breath, was uh, close to intubation. Um, that's kind of a picture of the, he had a saddle embolus, DVT. Uh, next slide. You can see his left uh, pulmonary artery there is relatively occluded. Um, so we did, uh, next slide, we went ahead and put in the ECOS catheters. Uh, we do that by a right, typically a right, maybe a left femoral vein access, two catheters each side. Um, you can see they're kind of the dots, they're in the pulmonary arteries each side. The dots is the ultrasound um, source. Uh, he got 24 milligrams of TPA over 24 hours. Um, we did this even though he was uh, post-op. Um, but after discussion with the surgeon and other, other factors, we decided to go ahead and give it a try. Um, next slide. So we had uh, a relatively probably on par with the studies, probably a 50 to 60 percent clot clearance. Uh, next slide. And uh, then looking at his uh, right heart strain, you can see kind of before it was definitely greater than 1 at 1.2, 1, 1 and then post-procedure uh, post it dropped down to 0.8. So he avoided intubation. Uh, we were able to treat his right heart strain um, he ended up doing well from that. Uh, next slide. So I just want to say in our experience, that's the kind of patient that I've, we felt like, especially being more in the uh, surgery realm, that we felt it really helped. Younger patients, big PEs, right heart strain. You could give them a low dose of TPA, um, minimal bleeding. Um, so in conclusion, 
Basically, RV dysfunction um, is usually the main or is the main cause of death uh, associated with acute um, uh, embolic events to the lungs. Anticoagulation, as I mentioned, it does halt propagation, but does not clear the existing thrombus. Um, endogenous fibro fibrinolysis is usually incomplete. There's always some residual left over. Um, as I mentioned, systemic thrombolysis does restore uh, heart function, <clears throat> but is associated with uh, increased risk of bleeding complications. Uh, next slide. So um, ultrasound-assisted uh, thrombolysis basically can use a lot lower dose of TPA. Uh, in our preliminary studies, it has shown to decrease uh, right heart strain, decreases the clot burden, um, and it does this with uh, much lower bleeding risks than uh, systemic fibrolysis. So obviously, more study is needed, uh, larger numbers, uh, to really prove that there is a decreased bleeding risk. Um, one of the things it doesn't really touch on is if it actually helps people that have acute shortness of breath. Uh, it doesn't really compare subjective symptoms like that. Um, yeah, I can tell you that in these studies, hospital stays really didn't decrease that much. Um, one thing is also we can't really tell you if uh, patients need less oxygen if they get this study versus more, that sort of thing. So in the grand scheme of things, um, you know, more data is needed, but I'd say preliminarily it seems like it could be a promising, uh, a promising technique to use.